Hello, this is Father Louis Skirty with the Word of Life and Well in the beautiful church of Espirito Santo in Florida. Today is the seventh Sunday of Ordinary Time, and we thank you for joining us. If you'd like to be on our email list, contact me at Father Lou Skirty, that's F R, Father Lou Skirty at hotmail.com. God bless you, and thanks for joining. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it became known that he was at home. Many gathered together so that there, were, there was no longer any room for them, not even around the door. And he preached the word to them and they listened. They came bringing to him a paralytic man carried by four men. Unable to get near Jesus because of the crowd, they opened up the roof above him. And after they had broken through, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there asking themselves, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who but God alone? And forgive sins. Jesus immediately knew in his mind what they were thinking to themselves, so he said, why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or rise, pick up your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paraplegic, I say to you, rise up, pick up your mat, and go home. He rose, picked up his mat at once, and went away in the sight of everyone. They were all astonished, and they glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In all honesty, we have to start with that reading from Isaiah 43. Although the main focus of the scriptures today, of course, are always the gospel, the supplementary word of God helps us appreciate it. The reading from Isaiah is God forgiving his people. They were abandoned, they felt, up in Babylon during the Babylonian captivity. So now they're coming back home. And God is saying to them that he's going to make things right. Because that was a punishment for their sins. In some ways, this, gospel, this reading from Isaiah might be the first example of tough love that has come down to us in many of our communities and, and groups of people, especially going through a 12-step program. Tough love. God telling his people that, okay, while you were in Babylon, you were separated from me. That was your punishment. Punishment for various things. The list goes on and on. For adoring false gods. For intermarriage with pagans. For going to pagan temples. And the list goes on and on. So, so what happens is they're abandoned. They're taken away through this Babylonian period. And now, through the inspiration of another leader, not mentioned here, his name is Cyrus, the people are able to go back home. And, and what, what do they see ahead of them? They see dryness and desert and, and awful, awful experiences that they're going to have to pass through in order to get back home. And the Lord says, now listen, I'm not remembering all the things of the past. I'm, I'm letting that ride. I know what you did. I'm letting all that ride. And all the stuff in the past, don't even think about it. I'm starting something new for you. I'm bringing you home. I'm going to have you pass through deserts where springs will, will flow and come forth and give you nurturing. 
I formed you as my people. And it's funny, God will never let us go. He, he forms us as his people, and here he tells us, I'm not letting you go. You, you got punished. Eh, you deserved it. But I'm not letting you go. I'm bringing you home. You went through the tough love of, of what you thought was abandonment, but a trial. And now you're coming back home because you are the people I formed. You burdened me with your sins. You wearied me. You aggravated me. You gave me crimes. And I'm still loving you and bringing you back home. Hear the tough love? When, when, when families deal with a child or, or an adult who's lost in addiction of some sort. The concept of tough love comes up very often when they're going through counseling. And the counselors will, and I myself being one of them, will tell the family, you, you've got to let him or her fight it himself. We can get him all the resources. We can put him in rehab. We can work by him. But you can't live his life. You have to let the person sometimes fall. And then we can start picking him up. And God did that centuries ago with the people of Israel, his own people. And he never forgot them. He didn't say, I don't love you, get out of my sight. No, you wearied me, you made me aggravated, you tired me, you got punished, now come on home, I love you. The doors are always open. God's house, the doors are always open. And often I like to say, you know, there's, there's no sin that any of us have ever committed that we can't be reconciled with. That we can't come before God and say, I'm sorry, and be forgiven and come back to the table. You're not that bad, no one is. If we just had that change of heart like we heard sung in the psalm. I think of Mary Goya, Mary, Mary Joy, excuse me. Mary Joy is a friend of mine from back home, back north. Mary is about in her 70s, okay? She's a, a Sicilian mother, okay? I'm Sicilian, so I really appreciated her personality. And, and she says, we're talking about someone who passed that long ago, and, and she wanted the children of this friend of hers to do this, this, this. And she says, you know, Father Lou, she says, she says as a mother, your kids can never hurt you enough. They could stab you in the back. They could shoot you. They could curse you. They could do everything. But you always love them because you're the mother. The husband, not so much. So husbands, beware, especially if you're married to a Sicilian. That's another story. So, so God is bringing us back. So yeah, we, we're talking about the people of Israel, but you know we, he's talking about us. We're on the brink of Lent. The time to return home. The time to, to realize that our God grabs us in his hands and brings us back home because he loves us. Oh, don't forget what you did. You should know it. God forgets it. God's putting it aside. I don't care if it was addiction. I don't care if it was abuse. I don't care if it was language. I don't care. It doesn't matter what it was. With a change of heart, the Lord's invite, inviting us back home. And for those of your family and friends who are not here, bring them back home during this time of repentance that's just on the brink, coming soon. What does this have to do with the scriptures today of the gospel? Mark's gospel is very interesting. You always have that parallel of, of forgiveness and healing and, and Jesus wanting to preach the gospel. And that's the package that Jesus has. He's here to preach the good news. He's here to be the good news. He's here to let us know how to get to the Father. And this example from Isaiah is, is also, not Jesus, it's Isaiah, but it shows us how to get to the Father by change of heart, by going home. So what does he do? He goes back home and his popularity is beyond bounds. But his popularity is because he healed people. He touched them, got healed. Whether they were blind, whether they were crippled, whether they had no food, he touched them, they were healed. Hey, we got a magic guy with us. We got a wonder woman, wonder man here. We got somebody who's super, we have a star among us. Let's get to Capernaum. Let's find out where he is. Maybe he can do more miraculous healings. And Jesus, you know, Jesus, I can just say Jesus saying, enough with the healings. You know, enough with the healings. Go to the heart of the message. And often Jesus tells us, oh, you're happy because you got healed. But I came to proclaim the good news. So he combines that ministry of good news with this healing of the paraplegic t tonight in the gospel. Now, could you imagine... Another beautiful thing going on, the, the support system of the paralytic. Four people are carrying him. 
There are crowds outside the doors of the home where Jesus is. They can't get in. So they say, let's climb on the roof. Now, the roofs weren't like this. They were probably thatched roofs. Jesus was probably sitting in what is like a courtyard of the home teaching. Because there were a lot of people there. We know the scribes were there. We know the people gathered at the door were there. So there's a lot of people around watching Jesus and listening to him. He's preaching goodness. He's preaching the good news. He's preaching a new way of, of taking God's covenant to heart and to live it with love and with charity and forgiveness. That gets pushed aside when the tiles open up and it's paralytic. The support system of the paralytic, don't lose that, those four people. How important our support systems are, and God forbid your support system, even if it's only four people, betray you. That was Judas, don't forget. Jesus had 12 in his support system. One denied him, one sold him for a few bucks. So know who your support system is, depend on your support systems. Family, friends, whoever they are, pray with them, be close to them. So the support systems of, of this paralytic lower him down. And I probably was very impressed. Jesus is very, very impressed with, with, with the whole machinations of what happened. So what does he do? He goes right to the heart of what he's all about. They're all, oh, let's see this miracle, let's see this, let's see this miracle worker do something with this paralytic. And he does. He goes to his heart. He goes to your and my heart. He has a, got an email, a very strange email last week. The, the homilies are online, as you know. Someone, lit, uh, not in this area, not in even in New Jersey, contacted me. Whatever I said in the homily the week before, she said, if people are ugly, physically ugly, and she went on to describe how ugly a person could be, physically. Are they being punished by God? And I didn't know who the person was, so I emailed her back. I said, is this a joke? She said, no. There is no ugliness to God. We're made in the image of God. God looks to our hearts and our souls. That's where potential ugliness could be for any of us. But God looks to our hearts. And for us who might be stupid enough to be prejudiced because someone is ugly or crippled or, or maimed or, or has an illness or a different color or speaks a different language or is an immigrant, for us who are that stupid, Jesus is pushing us out of the way. And he's calling us forward today as he says to the paralytic, don't forget, you know what they're waiting for. Get up and dance, paralytic. Come on, let's see Jesus do his thing. Your sins are forgiven. What does that have to do with being crippled? What does that have to do with being maimed? Jesus is going to our hearts. He doesn't care what you look like. When the woman described that character that she thought is an ugly person, is, is he punished by God? I said, that personality, that, that character that you painted, Jesus could have looked like that. We make him look great. You ever see an overweight Jesus on the cross? I mean, he's always good looking, he's tall, he's blonde, he's blue eyes. Maybe it's now we're getting the correct and we're making him a little darker skin, but he's always good looking. Have you seen some ugly people in the world? Middle Eastern people, or here in our own country, but Jesus was Middle Eastern. Some really ugly ones. He could have looked like that. Or he could have looked like you, God forbid. Or me, God forbid, really, God forbid. So Jesus is looking to our hearts and he looks to the heart of this paralytic and he wants to let people know that people aren't paralyzed or ugly or overweight or burdened with some disability because they're being punished by God. No, it has nothing to do with it. We're made in the image of God and some of us are short and some of us are tall. Some of us are heavy, some of us are thin. Some of us are rich and some of us are poor. But we're all made in the image of God. So he looks to the heart of that man and says, your sins are forgiven. And then he reads the minds of the critics, the phonies around him, the scribes. You know what the scribes are? The scribes used to be the people who literally wrote the scriptures. They would copy it. They're called scribes. They would copy it. So they knew the scriptures. They knew it verbatim. They knew all the, all the words of the scriptures. So did Jesus. His father wrote the scriptures. Why are you harboring these kinds of crazy thoughts in your head? 
What is it easier for the Son of Man, he identifies himself in Mark, the Son of Man to do? Say, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk? Get up and walk is a piece of cake for the Son of Man. Okay, just so you know who I am, Jesus is saying this. Just so you know who Jesus is, who the Son of Man is, I say to you, your sins are forgiven and get out of here. Pick up your mat and get out of here. That's the gospel. Not the healing, the proclamation of God's love and God's healing and God's forgiveness and God calling us back. On the brink of Lent, we hear these words in the scriptures. And as Paul says, it's not maybe yes, maybe yes. That letter from Paul was written to the Corinthians because he was supposed to visit, he missed his boat. He didn't get there. So they were upset. Oh, you promise, you make all these promises and you don't come to see us. We don't like you anymore. Paul says, listen, it's not me, it's God. And God is not yes, no, maybe I'll come, maybe I'm not going to come. God is always with you. Jesus came for all of us. Not for any one segment, not, not for the hierarchy, not from the new cardinals, not from the lowest person economically in our society. God, Jesus came for all of us and wants us to recognize and respect each other as his people formed in his image. God, through Isaiah, saying to us and saying to you and me right now, even though you burden me with your sins, even though you weary me with your crimes, I wipe out your offenses and I remember your sins no more because he loves us. He's our parent who gathers us together. He's our parent who teaches us to love and respect each other. He's our parent who once in a while has to give a little spanking for us and go through the experience of tough love. But he's never a parent who stops loving us. Jesus, his son, our brother, never stops loving us. No greater son. No greater gift. No greater example of how far he will go to show us he loves us. The cross. And what a proud father he had when he gave himself over to the Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. What a proud Father. And his response, the resurrection. Not even death could hold Jesus down. His Father was so happy with his example of love and forgiveness to us. Go. Share the good news. The healing of our bodies, maybe, but the healings of our souls and hearts, always.